Hello, and welcome to UNCO, a weekly interview podcast about what's unusual in tech. I'm your host, Timothy Buck. Blair Reeves is my guest this week. He's the author of Building Products for the Enterprise and the Principal Product Manager at SAS, the largest privately owned tech company in the world. We had a fascinating conversation about the major differences between the tech scenes in Silicon Valley and the southeastern parts of the United States, as well as what makes enterprise product management unique. I'm really excited to share this episode with you, but before I do, I'd just like to remind you that listeners like you, who enjoy my interviews each week, help keep the show around by becoming patrons over at patreon.com slash uncofm. Hi, Blair. How's it going? Hey, Tim. How you doing? I'm doing well. It is early here, but I'm glad to be doing this. And it was actually good because I got up early and I have my coffee and I'm uh, I'm excited for this conversation. I think there's a lot of a, a, a lot of interesting things that we have to talk about. Well, I, I, I apologize for making me get up so early. Um, yeah, this since you're from Carolina as well, um, I, I had a couple of Krispy Kremes this morning. Oh um, my gosh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm actually heading down to uh, downtown Raleigh for lunch with my wife uh, when we're done with this thing. We're gonna get, go to uh, um, uh, Beasley's Honey Chicken. So uh, okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's been outlawed now in San Francisco. Is that right? Uh, yeah, right along with the straws and uh, everything else. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Well, um, could you introduce yourself to to my listeners? Many of them, I'm sure, follow you on Twitter, but maybe just give them a little bit of background of of who you are and what you do, and and sure. then we'll get going. Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Blair Reeves. I'm a principal product manager here at SaaS Software, uh, which you are familiar with because since you're from North Carolina. But for those who aren't, uh, we are the uh, largest privately held software company in the world. Uh, we're based here in uh, Raleigh, really Cary, North Carolina, but Cary right outside Raleigh. People have heard of Raleigh. Um, let me see. So I'm product manager uh, in enterprise software. I've been doing this for a number of years now. Um, let's see. Uh, my wife and I and our daughter and our dogs live uh, in a little town called Pittsburgh, pretty close by. Uh, I co-authored a book uh, last year. Um, and I, sorry, it was actually published this year, I guess, um, with my friend Ben Gaines over at Adobe called Building Products for the Enterprise about product management in enterprise software, uh, which is a very exciting topic. Uh, more exciting than it sounds, I think, uh, but I, it's one that I find kind of kind of fun. And uh, yeah, I'm blog, I'm on Twitter, um, a lot of very good stuff too. Thanks for that. I think that that's really helpful for people to get a little bit more understanding of why I asked you on the show. I think, I think I want, like I said, when we were messaging before, I think talking about the differences between enterprise product management and, uh, and non enterprise product management is really interesting, but maybe before we jump, jump into that, we, we were talking a little bit about you being in, in the Carolinas and me being here in San Francisco. Yeah. What do you see as, I guess differences in the tech scene there. Uh, let me see. So it's a big question. Um, so I should preface this by saying I've never worked in Silicon Valley, uh, and I don't particularly like <laughs> Northern California, Southern San Francisco. It's a beautiful city, uh, and I have a lot of friends there and everything. Um, I just, you know, life has never really taken me to California, so. I don't speak about that from personal experience. I feel like working in tech, uh, you you don't you can't really escape, you know, the Bay Area perspective on a lot of this stuff, especially if you're on tech Twitter and you're you know, uh, interfacing mm-hmm. that kind of world, right? Um, so a couple of things that make uh, the tech scene here pretty interesting, and I should say also, uh, we did my wife and I did move to New York. We lived in New York for the last two years. We moved back. We were here in Carolina before that. We moved back here earlier this year. So we spent two years up in New York. Uh, so I kind of got to see kind of the tech scene up there, which I think is a little more similar um, than, uh, than of course, the Triangle is. So one thing about North Carolina and the uh, Research Triangle area, Raleigh-Durham, uh, is that uh, there's a very large uh, community of people here who have been working in technology for decades. Um, and a lot of people don't, don't know about that. So we were actually, IBM's largest campus in North America is here, and it's still here in Raleigh-Durham. 
there are something like 90,000 IBMers here um, at one wow. point. And uh, yeah. Uh, and so all this crazy stuff, like the, like the barcode was actually invented here. <laughs> um, a lot of the software for the Apollo missions was done here in Carolina. Like, um, and, and so that, no, my my wife's family actually. The reason she was basically raised, uh, born and raised here in Raleigh, was because her dad, like tons of other people here in the Research Triangle, was transferred here by IBM, and they've been here since the early '80s. So you know that's been in effect for for decades um, here in the Triangle, and and so that kind of diaspora of IBMers, um, there's still almost ten thousand IBMers here. It's many fewer than it used to be. Um, but those people have gone on to do things like, uh, you know, there's a, now there's Intel, there's Cisco, uh, both of which have very large thousands of people here. Um, I, so I work here at SAS. SAS has been, is 40 years old as a company. We're about 15,000 people, um, almost 10,000 of whom are here in Cary. Um, and a lot of people, there's a lot of migration between all the really big employers. So there's a lot of big employers, big tech companies here. Uh, Red Hat is is headquartered just down the road in Raleigh. Yep. My wife actually works there. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that kind of, there's a big, there's a long lasting and decades long diaspora of tech people all throughout the triangle here. Um, and so that has led to a lot of what well, we don't have as much at, like, you know, you have in New York and like San Francisco. Um, we haven't had as many like uh, breakout startups that have like gone public or been acquired or things like that. We certainly have a number of them. Um, but you know, there's like, you know, in the like low hundreds millions, we have a, have a couple of those, um, and then smaller than that. But the research triangle area has been more characterized by very large kind of institutional tech, tech employers. Um, and that, it, you know, so it makes for a very different kind of scene. Um, there's a lot of venture funding, but the venture funding isn't anywhere close to the kind of scale you see in the Bay area, of course, or in New York, yeah. no, no, it isn't anywhere. So that's not really a really good comparison. I don't like, to, <laughs> so, you know, I don't think that it's, it's good to compare any, you can't compare anywhere to the Silicon Valley, right? It doesn't make any sense to compare this to New York. I think it makes a little more yep. sense to compare, you know, the research triangle area to like Austin or to Columbus or to uh, Boston in some ways, um, you know, places that are not, you know, tier one cities. The whole metropolitan area here is what, like two million, two and a half million, mm -hmm. um, maybe two million, something like that. And that's like between, split between Raleigh, which is, of course, the capital of the state, and Durham, which is right next door. Uh, it has like a, you know, 300,000 people there. Chapel Hill, of course, we have, you know, so three major research universities, which tr contribute in a huge way to, um, you know, both the commercial and cultural life, as well as feeding tons of talent into all these, you know, institutions, which is really cool. Um, and I, I think a really big part of this as well is that it's just a very young area. Um, very young, very diverse area. So, I mean, we're far more racially diverse than you'll see in most parts of Silicon Valley, um, right. which is if you go there and you walk around and being from Carolinas, you'll, know I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's striking to me whenever I go there, how not diverse <laughs> the Bay area looks. And of course it's a little misleading because, you know, people, you know, there's a very large Asian community, of course, um, uh, and, and certainly a very large Hispanic community, but they're kind of pushed to the edges you know, in ways that you just don't see here. Right. That was actually something that stood out to me. Like when, when I'd, I'd been in Greenville, South Carolina for a while and Asheville, North Carolina, which are both primarily a white areas. Yeah. Um, and obviously there, there was, there were, there was diversity there. It just was not around me. And, uh, living in San Francisco proper, you actually do see a little bit more of that than you do maybe in the Valley. But even here, it's just so expensive that, like you said, the many, uh, much of the diversity has been pushed out or, or kind of like segregated into certain areas of the city or 
you know, pushed into Oakland or past Oakland and a lot of, a lot yeah. of people are commuting in. Yeah. I think if you take the entire Bay area, like, uh, then you, there, there probably is technically a significant amount of diversity. It's just in, in certain areas, especially the areas that have a focus uh, where a lot of these tech companies are or San Francisco itself, and especially the areas where these tech companies have offices, there isn't that level of, of racial diversity that you would, you would want to see. I mean, I think you see that as part of like the, uh, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily a conversation where I was planning to get into, but that's, that's part of why you see that in, in tech. Yeah. Yeah. I don't actually know like the diversity statistics about the, the triangle area, but I, I was in Houston and working for HP for a couple years. And I was really surprised to hear that Houston is actually one of the uh, most diverse cities in America in as far as like percentage of different uh, racial populations. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. Well, and, and I don't want to like, I don't want to like make it out, make out, you know, the triangle or anywhere else to be, you know, perfect by any means. We have, we have big problems, as, you know, here as well. It's just that they pale in comparison to what the Valley focuses on, you know, it, it is experiencing. Uh, and, and I think a lot of that is driven by housing, you know, like, oh, 100%. I, you know, like my wife and I bought our first house here a few months ago and um, it was expensive. Don't get me wrong, but like, it was doable you know, like on my yeah. income and, and then also you know, on her income as well. And, um, you know, we have affordable housing is a big topic here in Raleigh, Durham, but look, I used to live in Durham and, you know, you walk, you, you, you drive through downtown Durham on one part side of the street, they're putting up a 600 unit apartment complex on the category into that there's a 400 unit complex going up down the street. There's a 300 unit complex going up. I mean, they are building housing like crazy here, both like downtown, like apartment, you know, sort of style living, as well as you drive throughout any part of the triangle and they're building um, townhouses, small lot houses, new developments. I mean, it's it's going completely bonkers here, um, which is great, which, you know, build all the housing. <laughs> and uh, I think I, I think a lot of those sorts of things fit into the calculus of, you know, we were on the very short list for Amazon HQ2. Um, it's widely yeah. expected that we are going to be the site for Apple's second campus. Um, and there's been all kinds of rumors coming out from the General Assembly that uh, Apple and <clears throat> the, the state government are going to announce that that, that, that that is happening like any day. But there's been this like continued political wrangling um, in the general assembly that has kind of pushed that off. So that's probably going to be announced any day. Apple's going to come here. They're going to, you know, whether it's 5,000 people or 10,000 people or whatever. I mean, we've shown that, uh, the triangle can absorb that and can, we have the talent base to support that. The big joke around like <laughs> SAS and IBM and all the other guys here is that like, as soon as Apple announces, like we all get a 15% pay <laughs> bump or something, you know? Um, we'll see if that happens, <laughs> but, um, but housing is a big part of that. And, there, and we can build housing here because we don't have all the stupid hangups that, you know, the Bay area is never going to build more housing. And I think big people are seeing that now. And, you know, so yeah, I, I hope they do, but if they don't, all that, all their growth is going to spill over into other markets and that benefits us. So by all means, Bay area people stop building. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's probably not gonna be very popular with your listeners, I guess, but it works for me. Hey, uh, can you hear me now? You, yeah, I can. I don't, uh, Skype is just doing its thing. Yeah. I, I, th I think, uh, you're right that the, I mean, we, uh, we're not <laughs> professionals at knowing how to build cities or anything like that, but uh, I, th I think it's really clear what a lot of the problems here in the Bay area are. And I think there are a lot of cities out there that are, that are preparing themselves to, you know, like you said, take that growth, you know, uh, you've got Austin, you have, uh, even Greenville, South Carolina is starting to see some growth there similar to Austin. You've got the Raleigh Durham area, you have Boston, you have, um, you know, places all over the U S and all over the world that are willing to take that. 
Well, I, I don't think it's a, they're not just willing to take it, but like they can, like you know, yeah. one of the and I, I, I gather this is not the discussion you really had in mind, but I have a like, I, the problem. One of the big problems is that we have this idea of talent as some sort of innate thing, and the way that Silicon Valley thinks of talent is, it, you know, you you went to Stanford or Harvard, and you fit a very specific profile. It's usually white. It's usually male. Uh, it's usually from some name brand school that like the other people at this company went to and have heard of, and that's what's going to get you in. And, you know, there's, there's such a strong, imp, in, you know, impact of network effects on, on that hiring. And that's why people don't get hired. And that, and like, you know, then they, you know, you know recruiters go through this pattern matching thing and pattern matching usually means white and male. And when that's the way you think of talent, like that, that is naturally exclusionary. And like, that's the, that plus all the housing and cost of living stuff in the Bay area, there's only certain people who can afford to go and just move to the Bay area with either a tentative job offer or no job offer. And um, that leads to a very exclusionary market. I mean, Silicon Valley is a lot more like wall street than, than they want to believe. Um, you know, they culturally, the culturally the two kind of hate each other, but they're very similar. Uh, and I think the tech, the tech industry would be a lot healthier if they moved into more cities, moved to Raleigh, Atlanta, Houston, uh, even you know DC. But then also just change the way they pattern match for hiring, because I think that you know the, the talent required to do most jobs in the te in the tech industry uh, is is far more um, accepting of people with different backgrounds than uh, it seems to be. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I feel like um, being even just in Greenville and I started a company there that and, you know, we were building software and stuff. And the the people that I started that business with and I mean, they were plenty talented enough to move here and work in any of these companies. You know, like they they're very talented developers and they're doing just fine working at whatever companies they're working at in the South but um they're not going to get a job out here if they were to just like apply you know it yeah. just it's just going to be i mean maybe they will if they want to but also they don't want to like it's just so yeah, expensive I mean, to move out here and and uh, it just despite all of the 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 like craze around working remotely and stuff like these these companies won't even really even look at you if you don't have the bay area on your your resume a lot of times. And I know there's a, there's a lot of out there that are, that, that can push back against that. I know like Envision is an interesting tech company that does design software and they have a lot of remote workers. Um, yep. and, and there, there are plenty of exceptions, right. That have, that allow remote work or that have offices in many cities or, or whatever it may be. But, uh, one thing I noticed just personally is, you know, being in Houston, uh, at, at HP, I, I would get people reaching out to me some for, for interviews or whatever, but it was, it was pretty rare, you know, maybe like once a month or something. And usually they weren't companies that I was interested in. And, uh, when I was in South Carolina, it was very similar. And, and then like, I just put San Francisco on my LinkedIn. And basically since the day I moved here, I've, like nothing changed about my resume, I, but I've been receiving like three plus people reaching out to me f f about opportunities or they wanted the recruiters wanting to talk to me or, or companies calling me or whatever, basically three times a week since I moved here. Yeah. And, and, and it, it wasn't like my resume just like drastically got better when my address changed. <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it didn't, it was literally the same. Like I hadn't changed it. Right. I just started a new job and nothing had, had changed and I'm getting reached out to when I've been at a job for a week. Like uh, it's, uh, and, and that kind of ties into what you were saying. Like it, it's almost like part of the criteria is like, if you can prove that you can live here, then that's like, that's like you've crossed a hurdle almost <laughs> like, yeah. Like you have to have a certain level of, of, I, I don't know. It, that may, I don't, then that thinking isn't even right because like there are plenty of people who can afford to live here and it has nothing to do with their skill level. 
we can probably wind down that conversation. Maybe Skype uh, uh, cutting us off was a good call. Uh, I think it is interesting. I know I know people talk about it a lot on different podcasts, but it, it's a problem that we need to solve uh, as an industry. And I think it is valuable to to talk about it. Like, yeah letting people know that there is a lot of growth in these smaller cities that maybe uh, people can, can actually move to. And there are companies out there like yours and, and others that are, are large and profitable and successful and uh, making software that really has an impact packed on the world, but aren't in the Valley. Yeah. Yeah. And and I just think sometimes it's easy to look for those names that they've heard of because they're on TechCrunch and that's not necessarily the right thing for every person and it's it's probably not best for uh this industry if we're just so so focused here. Yeah. Yeah. And it it, it just comes down to um what people are willing to or what companies are willing to do and how they're willing to work. If they want to continue working the way they've always worked well there's not much we can do for about it you know so um yeah and 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 i guess i i would add one thing like if you're starting a company like if if you if you are out here the access to capital here the the reason startups happen here is is because there is a an ecosystem here that's incredibly powerful and it's that that startups do happen in london and and New York and other places as well that end up being successful. But part of the reason there is this insularness of the Valley is because it has seen so much success over the years. And I just wanted to add that on because it's, it's not like, I don't think anybody was like, let's create this insular place because that's what we want. It, it's more like just a result of the ongoing success that has occurred o- over the last, you know, well now 50 years or so yeah yeah i totally agree well yeah so listen to to move on from from that topic you wrote a book specifically about enter, enterprise product management and i i am a, a product manager non enterprise product manager here in in the bay area and before this i was a product manager at a business intelligence company that built software for the enterprise so our customers were like Wells Fargo and uh, Barclay card. And so you're probably pretty big, familiar you know, with SAS in that case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like big, big, you know, uh, enterprise enterprises that used our software. So I, I think that's probably actually when I first found you on Twitter was maybe when I was working there, just because hearing you tweet and talk about that was helpful for me because um, oh, there isn't cool. a lot of people talking about enterprise product management and maybe just because it's not considered as sexy or, or, or whatever, it's just a big part. It's a really important part of the tech community that doesn't really get a lot of voice. So people hate uh, enterprise I software, thought, man. I, I don't understand why. <laughs> well, well, okay. I mean, I, I, I could get into why, if you want, oh, but, well, I, I have but some before ideas we, about why too, but yeah. yeah, yeah. But before we do that, maybe just explain to people what you see the differences are between enterprise product management and regular like consumer product management or, uh, you know, small to medium sized business product management. Yeah. 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 Well, so I think that the impression I often get is that a lot of product managers, uh, especially those working in consumer uh, products have never worked in enterprise and don't really have a whole lot of exposure to it. Um, and I think that, you know, as I, when I became a product manager several years ago, and I started working in the area. I was reading all the stuff about the field and, and the practice and everything. And uh, the more and more I started to notice that like a lot of the stuff in the product management popular literature uh, didn't seem to have a whole lot of connection to my actual job. Um, and, you know, a lot of it was kind of useful, but a lot of it is very high level and airy in general. And like, you know, like, you know, be a truth seeker or <laughs> crap like that. Yeah. And I was like, what the hell do they even need? You know, I'm not a Zen, Zen master here. I'm just trying to do a job. And um, so I'm friends with Ben, Ben Gaines. Uh, and he and I started like, we 
send each other little like snippets on Twitter or email or whatever, being like, look at this article. This is kind of silly and and that sort of thing. And um, at that time, he was the he was a senior product manager for Adobe Analytics, and now he's a, like the group manager. He's like the dark lord of Adobe Analytics. So we were competitors oh, and cool. still are competitors in ways. Um, and uh, so we, finally, you know, he and I got together. Uh, we had dinner in New York one night and we were talking about this. And I was like, you know, look, dude, like we should, there's nothing being written out there about like enterprise software and how product management is done in enterprise software. Cause like it's meaningfully different in a number of ways. And we can get into that. Um, and I'm just not seeing anything out there about it. And so let's write down what we know. And so we plan to like self publish it on Amazon or make it a big blog or something. And, um, as it turned out, it got like O'Reilly was interested in it and they picked it up and then they published it. So now that's, that's the genesis of the book. Um, and I, what I found was that we had a, a lot of reception to it from a lot of people in enterprise software for whom there isn't a whole lot out there. Um, and then we also got a lot of we, some surprising reception from folks who aren't in enterprise who are either interested in it or just want to learn more about the, uh, market because um, there's, you know, things that people didn't really consider before that have consequences on how product management is done uh, in, in our industry. That, that story makes a lot of sense. Like I was just saying, when I was working in that, there weren't a lot of resources. A lot of the, the, the mainstream kind of practice of product management as it's portrayed in the literature comes out of a couple of things. It comes out of first uh, Google, um, so they have their famous, you know, associate product manager APM program that graduated yep. folks, you know, everyone from like, you know, Marissa Mayer to half of the VCs <laughs> in the Valley. Um, uh, and then they kind of evangelize that model elsewhere. Um, it's a big mess. <laughs> Not to say there's any good stuff on there. Um, but, uh, that And then, of course, to Facebook. So Google and Facebook have really evangelized a model of product management, which is very, very effective, obviously, in a lot of ways, um, but is not really as applicable to the enterprise because product managers at Facebook and product managers at Google, broadly writ, don't talk to customers because they don't have customers, right? They have advertisers, Um now, I, I, someone's going to like pop in and be like, well, actually, you know, I was at Google on this one business unit. We had whatever, you know, I don't mean that. I mean, generally, like, those are advertising companies and they don't they have users. So there's all this focus on user experience, user design. A lot of that is is the genesis for design as the sole focus of tons and tons and tons of people in our industry, which is great. Um, but they don't they, they don't have salesforce they don't talk to sellers right they don't talk to you know their user is the king and they need to maximize that's, a lot of that comes back to the maximum maximization of user engagement is like their key kpi i guess that's redundant but you know what i mean so yeah <laughs> uh, so uh and and that isn't really the case for us and uh i think i've, I've seen especially recently a lot of people kind of you know, try to casually apply the same lessons into enterprise in a very kind of cavalier way. And they kind of miss that um, those things don't really apply to an enterprise software market. I just wrote a blog post a little while ago um, to, that kind of gives a primer for like people who are just going into enterprise, like here are the big things you need to understand about how our market works a little bit differently. Um, and again, we can talk about that in a minute. Um, cause, but I think that there are there's a, there's an underappreciation for how you know our the, the things that we are maximizing for and optimizing for are different than they are on the consumer side, and that has big implications for what product managers do, what our job is like, and what our responsibilities are, what, what kind of software we design and plan and, and and build and service are. So that's a really good point, and and. Uh... I mean, some people may push back and say there are a lot of subscription services in the Bay Area that, uh, you know, they they are they do have a, a a customer that's paying money, and so they're unlike Google and Facebook, there there is more than just uh, like usage. There's a lot of 
uh, focus on making sure they provide enough value to actually pay. But, but yeah, you're right. An enterprise is, is very different in that the person using the software is very often not the person purchasing the software. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find that a lot of, a lot of Bay area enterprise startups, um, particularly follow, uh, sort of a slack version of in, yeah. uh, market entry in which is sort of a bottoms up hearts and minds kind of thing where they want everyone, they introduce a freemium product that everyone can use and they try to upsell you into different paid tiers, um, yeah. which is a tried and true model that you can do. It's very, very difficult to do unless you are a VC backed company that doesn't mind burning a lot of money <laughs> for a long time. Um, and I think that that, act, that that track is getting increasingly more difficult as time goes on because, you know, yeah, I think so. Everyone, everyone but, can't but... be slack. <laughs> No, and, and I, I, I agree, but I think this kind of what we're pointing out here is Facebook and Google, they're very, let's do all this measurement of making sure that our users continue to use this product, A, B, N, test everything to make it as easy to use or addictive to use as possible. Yep. And so that model has shown great success for them and for so many others in the Bay Area. Let's make our users love it. Let's make the uh, the experience really, really good. Let's, let's have this big focus on design. And, and that actually is something that, uh, while it can't be the sole focus in enterprise software design, I think the absence of that is often why so many people dislike enterprise software, right? Like if, if you have worked at an enterprise, uh, I mean, I've, I've worked at HP, uh, which at the time had, I think, 70,000 employees, right? So like a, a very enterprisey enterprise. <laughs> enterprise yeah. Um, right. The, there, there were problems about the software that we had to use for certain things. It was terrible to use. And it had to account for all of these difficulties that the business had, for having 70,000 employees, right, across the world and being a 70-something-year-old company and all of the complications that come with that. And enterprise software needs to solve those really hard problems that, that uh, like, small, medium-sized business software doesn't. But, but uh, it, it solved those problems while also not solving the end user's problem very well. Yep. And I think that's what, where you get this pushback is for people who've worked in enterprises or have heard of it, like the stereotypical enterprise software is ugly, but utilitarian. It's great for the executive because they get whatever data they need out of it. It's great for the person who had the buying decision because they have 5,000 checkboxes of every feature it has, even if those features are terrible the, it, it has like a, like a, you know, a CYA mentality in purchasing <laughs> oftentimes of, uh, if I buy this one and it has 75 features, including chat and converse and all this other stuff built in, then like, if I buy this other one that is more focused, uh, it, people are going to say, why did you spend more money on on like having to buy two or three different types of software. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's where people are frustrated oftentimes with enterprise software, but it's also a big opportunity for enterprise software product managers. If, if, if we, well, not at me anymore, but if we can do both of, of like realizing that we have more people than just the end user to keep in mind. We need to make sure the end user is satisfied, but also the purchaser and the uh, IT department and the uh, like the business as a whole are all getting the right value out of it. Then I, I almost see that as that's something that we can learn from each other, right? Like enterprise yeah. product managers yeah. can learn about being user focused and regular product managers can a small medium to small business product managers can focus on making sure that they're building something that uh, not only the user finds value from, but also the business and the IT department and all of that. Well, I, I think that recently you've heard um, 
a lot more talk about this, what, what they call the consumerization of enterprise software, where, mm -hmm. you know, the stereotype is that, okay, we have all these millennials like me coming in who, uh, you know, we're, you know, we've been using Facebook and Google and whatever, our iPhones for years, and we expect the same level of like design, simplicity, and ease of use from the tools we use at work. Um, and there, uh, I think this is a, um, I think this, this point has been played to death and it, it, it's not that it's not true. It's just that it's very, 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 um, simplistic. Um, that is sometimes the case, you know, you know, people hate using software that they hate to use. Right. Um, here, but my, my, my famous stat I always had to go back to is that, you know, for, have you ever used Lotus notes? I have not. I've heard of it, but I haven't used it. Yeah, okay, yeah. So everyone has heard of Lotus Notes because it is the worst <laughs> piece of software. It, I mean, uh, you know, it, the, like you know, people in like giant organizations like UPS used it. A bunch of banks use it. Like it's 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 everywhere. It's not as big as Outlook, of course, but like it's it's a it's a very 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 popular. Uh, I should say it's very very uh, widely used suite of like. Um, uh, email software that t the huge organizations uh, and companies often buy. It is a huge pain in the ass to use. Um, I, as an IBMer, I used it for years, um, and so I can say this: it's just terrible. It is a it's a, it's a highly reliant and highly available database so, you know program with like an email client built on top of it. Um, and everyone everyone absolutely hates using it. But here's the thing. IBM still makes like close to a billion a year selling it. Um, it's it, like they make tons of money on it, even still today. Yep. And uh, so, you know, there are certain there are certain areas of software of, of enterprise software um, in certain industries for certain roles and certain jobs, functional areas, uh, where the consumerization of enterprise software is real. Um, you see that with Slack, you see that with the move towards, you know, tools like Trello and like Jira, um, mm -hmm. and there's uh, collaboration tools coming online that are really exciting. And then, so you see some of that going on in other parts, it is just not true. Uh, <laughs> like there are, um, like, you know, point of sale software is a good example of this. The people who use point of sale software do not matter. Uh, in large or large corporations, you know, who are buying very complex point of sale software, uh, the people who are making the the buying decisions for those things do not care at all what the ten dollar an hour, eight dollar an hour, you know, retail operator thinks or how easy they find the software to use. What they care about is uh, functionality and security. Um, there are a million other examples of things like that. Uh, BI software is famously um, a pain to use because um, I mean in some in some places sure. as, you, as you well know in some places user experience really matters a lot because those users have a large amount of influence on the buying decisions for the, that, that that software uh, and in other places they just don't um, so I think that this is there there not that there isn't some truth in this idea. It's just that it's a highly simplified I, you know, version of the idea that people who co come from consumer software with a heavy design background have a natural bias to, to think about. They think about, well, if users love my software, then they're going to buy it. And that's not really the, always the case. Um, that isn't to say we don't think about our users and user experience. We want that experience to be great. Um, it's just that it's, it's one of many considerations that we have to take into account. And I think that that, that the um, the prioritization uh, or the uh, distribution of, of those needs that we have to optimize for as enterprise product managers isn't always fully appreciated by people who come from a, a, a software world where, you know, user experience is all that matters because all a user has to do is, you know, they, they have a million different alternatives and you just turn yours off and use another one. And that's it. Yeah, and, and I think another thing that's interesting about a, a difference is when you're a product manager for a consumer, uh, like a, an individuals out there, you have a scale oftentimes that allows you to do certain types of testing, certain types of research that aren't as, 
you know, you're not having to sit down and have a conversation with somebody. You're, you're just basically measuring, uh, their decision-making and their, how, how often they're using the product and what type of actions they're making in the product. And that's how you decide what to do next. Right. Or, or if, if what you did was successful, maybe, whereas, uh, I know at least for me in the software that, that we built, we didn't have hundreds of thousands of users, you know, like yeah. I, I was building software that was automating the ETL process for, for business intelligence systems. Then, and, and our users were developers and DBAs, yeah. right? So like we're talking, uh, uh, developers and DBAs inside enterprises over a certain size that, can afford to spend significant amount of money on software purely to automate a step in like a developer's process. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and so like our number of users was, was small compared to that. Right. And like it, it still made plenty of money because each user license was a lot of money uh, because it provided a lot of value to those companies. Um, but the way that you, you get feedback is very, very different. I, I, one, one thing, one thing that we've always, always found, uh, especially in a lot of like functional software, like things that people use either for, in your case, data analysis, data visualization, uh, in marketing technology uh, is, is as big as well. People who are, especially people who are, you know, evaluated on, 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 a um, quantitative metrics like this, like number of marketing leads passed to sales, right? Or marketing you know, marketing leads generated from email channel, social channel, whatever, or you know, it's financial stuff like that. Um, those people are highly focused on the functionality of the tool, and uh, mm -hmm. they will use a tool that gets the job done for them and and helps them do that get do their job quickly and efficiently. Uh, even if they hate the design, they'll tell you, you know, oh yeah, it's ugly. It does this, it does that, whatever. It looks like Excel, but I tell you what, it does the job, and so I use it. Um, and so, you know, you always you might hear design feedback, um, but you know, your power users or your your most effective users will often, you know, focus in on on feature level stuff first. Again, it doesn't mean the design doesn't matter. It matters, matters a lot. Um, I mean, it depends on what, who your user is, right? Like design is building something, knowing who your user is, right? And so for, for that use case, like knowing that our user was a, a developer or a DBA and, you know, all of these, they're technical, they're working with data, they're doing an ETL process, they are if using our software to automate that so that it saves them time and money, Right. That means that the type the type of design for that application is not going to be like tons of white space and like airy and and illustrative and that it, it it's like it, it it's going to be very utilitarian, but that is actually good design for that type of user, right? Because it's it's the best way to achieve that user's goals. Yeah. Um and I think that's another thing that's often forgot about when when we think about enterprise software or design for things that are not, you know, somebody's mom at home or some marketing manager or some social media manager, right? Like if, if it's a, 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 the person using it is needing to do something, uh, I mean, really, again, it comes back to good product management is making sure that you build a product that is providing value to your customers, right? And, it, it it's a it's good to to get another another view on that to show that not everybody's customers are the the blogger who wants to write about cool new software or uh the guy who does his podcast from his iPad or whatever <laughs> yeah. you know it's like um it, it, there there are a lot of people out there who you know they're using their windows machine that their company gave them and their like 20 inch monitor and that they're having to get things done and they're doing real business and real work and 
that what is a good product for them is oftentimes very different than what is a good product for the stereotypical Silicon Valley user. Well, what's a good product for an executive is often a very different pro- question of what's a good product for a frontline employee too, you know? And, and, and one thing, um, I think that is 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 important to to point out here also is 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 just to, just to stress again like you know if you're doing a job right so if you're building building software that companies are going to buy and use you know selling your software or, or you know building revenue um, requires selling right um, I think that enterprise software is involves a much larger degree of like salesmanship uh, it's about selling software not about user growth or growth hacking or any of that crap. Um, and that's another facet of this. I think is really important for people coming who don't come from enterprise because, you know, and a lot of, a lot of people, um, both inside, uh, but in consumer software, but also in other areas, um, like kind of like look down on sales. Like they, they think sales is like icky and like, you know, um, dirty or they don't like, they don't like doing it. You know, it's unpleasant. It's like an unpleasant chore. Um, and that is a really, uh, you know, negative attitude <laughs> to hold about something that's so critical to your business. Um, sales is well, the, the most, the most read blog post I've ever had was one about, you know, learn to learn to sell. It is that selling is absolutely critical to your business. And if you shouldn't hire anyone who holds an attitude about sales, like it's not their job, the entire company is in the sales department, right? Um, even people in engineering are, you know, by transit property doing sales and, um, that, you know, a, a really well oiled, well functioning enterprise sales operation is a really complex thing. And a really, it, it's really interesting how it works. Um, but it, it, it requires product management involvement. And if you haven't sold software before, then you could, you, you very easily think that, oh, well, if I build a really pretty tool here. People will definitely use it, right? And um, yeah. sales, sales, you can't sell software without selling software. And, and, and that's a big part of it that I don't think it's nearly enough attention and, um, and one that I might write a little bit more about in the future. I don't know. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good point. I, I think it, it is, it, it kind of all ties together. It's, it's so easy to focus on the uh, tech crunchy Silicon Valley type companies that are primarily focused on, or at least the ones that we, we hear about the most are primarily focused on either small and medium sized businesses or consumers. And that has a certain approach to product management that is successful and is valid, but there are other approaches that are necessary for other types of customers. And, uh, I think that's good to hear. Um, I, I, um, have to drop off for another call and just a minute. Um, so to wrap this up, what is what is one thing that you find unusual in tech right now? Um, I think that uh, a big thing you're seeing that I think is really interesting is, is how much more difficult it's becoming for any consumer facing business to grow in in, in the in the GAFA era, the Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon world, if you're not part of their ecosystem, uh, it's just, like, customer acquisition is just going to be really, really difficult and expensive. And you're seeing that even especially in the direct consumer, um, you know, uh, marketplace right now, you know, there's that whole mm-hmm. thing about how customer acquisition is the new rent, right? Um, and it's, yeah. it's just, it's just brutal. Um, and it's going to get harder, uh, cause they, they're monopolies. Uh, they own all your trust requisition. So that's really hard in enterprise. There is no GAFA. Um, there are big incumbent vendors and it's, and it can be difficult. Um, and there are certainly obstacles, but it's nothing like the, the GAFA world where, and most, for the most part, those guys haven't really touched uh, enterprise in enterprise, you know, the, the, the companies executing the best out there right now in enterprise SaaS are Adobe and Salesforce, bar none, hands down, and they're, they're kicking ass. And, but I think there's a, there's a, there's a ton of different areas of the workplace about how we work, working practices, collaboration, 
and so forth that are still basically rooted in the 80s or 70s even. Um, and I think that part of that is, you know, the, the, there's a real resistance to evolution in our working practices, uh, in, especially in American companies, but, uh, but, well, I should say in American companies and especially abroad, that really holds us back from a lot of things, especially in how we do knowledge work. And I think that um, the companies I think are most interesting right now are the ones who are changing the way we work and making the way we work more effective and more productive. And some of those, I've, you know, I'm a huge Atlassian fan. I'm a big Slack fan. Yeah, I was just about to bring Atlassian up. And did you hear about their oh yeah their yeah. deal with Slack just oh, yesterday? Oh, dude, I'm I'm a shareholder, man. I'm I'm happy today. <laughs> <laughs> nice um, and. Uh, but but I mean those are just those that's, that that's, it goes beyond what they're doing now. I think that companies that they're doing in, stuff in that area are 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 doing some really cutting edge stuff that's going to change uh, the world. And and um, uh, maybe Microsoft will acquire them sooner or later. I don't know. Uh, maybe or maybe they'll be an, another independent company. And uh, but there are a bunch of companies who are doing stuff in collaboration. I think is uh, is super interesting. Yeah yeah I agree. That's really cool. So uh, where can people find you on the internet, Blair? Uh, I'm on, uh, I tweeted at Blair Reeves. Um, my blog is blairreeves.me. Um, and I'm sure you'll put all that in the notes or whatever. But uh, I, I, I write about something, I tweet about it. Um, and um, I'm always here to hear, pe- I'm happy to hear people disagree. So um, yeah, reach out. That's great. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Blair. It was it was a lot of fun to record, and I think the purpose of the show is to talk about uh, what's unusual in tech, and if we don't have perspectives from people not in the Valley and people who are not working on consumer-facing products, then we're not going to really have the have those conversations and that the show is all about. So it, it's been really great to have you on. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me on, man. I pre- really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, man. See ya. See you, Tim.